Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Catherine Lemoyne, and I serve as Associate Vice Chancellor of Nunez Community College, and I am so proud to serve as the MC for this Shark Tank styled pitch event. As you know, this pitch competition is presented by the St. Bernard Economic Development Foundation and has produced several amazing businesses as a result of its nine year tenure. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Startup St. Bernard was open to any business under five years old that agreed to locate their base of operations to St. Bernard Parish and participate in its entrepreneurial ecosystem. An independent scoring committee chose the three finalists based on business viability criteria and the quality of their business plans. Those finalists will pitch their businesses today to our esteemed panel of judges who will select the winner. All three finalists are winners with the two runners up receiving a $5,000 grant that can be used to fund advancements in their business. The winner will receive the remainder of the approximately $100,000 prize package, which includes a mix of cash and in-kind services. Wow, what a prize package. <laughs> Each of the finalists will give their live pitch and then we will turn it over to the judges for a Q&A session. After each of the three entrepreneurs have pitched, the judges will retreat to a private meeting room to select the winner. So are we ready to get started? All right, so now let's get started with our first entrepreneur. First up, we have All Tails Wagging, who would be the first dog daycare and boarding facility in St. Bernard Parish. So let's see that pitch. Welcome forward. I'm Jamie LeBlanc. My business is not open and it's called All Tales Wagon. It's a dog daycare and boarding facility located in St. Benoit Parish in Fortress to be exact. How many of y'all have a dog? How many of y'all consider the dog a member of y'all family? Okay. This is Murphy. Murphy has his own birthday parties, he gets presents. Um, he has his own TikTok and he has like 1,200 followers. <laughs> I do have other animals, I'm just gonna brag on Murphy a little bit. But he is my everything, I don't have any children so I'm considering him my child. So, my family last year wanted to go to Vegas so they asked me what I got with them. So my first thought was, what am I gonna do with all my animals? So my friend that would normally watch them she wasn't going to be able to do it, so I said, all right, let me look around in the board and options in St. Bernard Parish. And the only options available was the vet clinics. And when I called, the dogs only stay in a metal cage. They come out three times a day at 10 minutes at a time to go potty, and that's it. So they're only in contact with the person for 30 minutes at a time. And I mean, 30 minutes throughout the whole day. I didn't want that for my uh, So my next option was going to be in New Orleans, Slidell, and Mattery for their board and facilities. And I didn't like the idea that if they were bigger, they would have 30, 40 dogs all in one room at a time. I know they would have multiple people in there with them, but my dogs are special. They need <laughs> individualized attention and on a smaller group scale. <clears throat> so I started looking into pet setters and the Rover app come, kept coming up, so I looked into that. There was no one in St. Bernard on the Rover app, so it was gonna be outside our area. And I didn't know those people, so I was like, we have a problem in our parish. I could be the solution. I already have two existing buildings on my property that I own, and I have the yard right next to it, or the land right next to it, to put the play yards to make, you know, play yards for the dogs. So, so how it came to be. Um, so I went ahead and joined the Rover app as a pet sitter myself. I started doing dog daycare and dog boarding out of my home. I started doing drop-in visits at the customer's homes, and I realized there was a big demand for this. People go out of town all the time, they work long hours, so they need somebody to take care of their babies when they're gone. So, so far I've been on Roba for about a year now. I've watched over 29 dogs. By word of mouth, I've got 19 outside dogs other than the Roba. Um, so this is definitely kicking up and I am outgrowing my house. <laughs> I need to get this two buildings going and running so I can get out of my house with all these dogs. Um, 
And by you know helping all these people, I realized that they want more for their dogs. They want somebody that's going to give them individualized attention, do some activities with them. Um, and I also wanted to educate myself, so I became certified in the fear-free method, which helps reduce fear and anxiety in dogs, and also got certified in the Victoria Stowell Startup Program, which helps, you know, teaches the dog positive reinforcement. I also became a member of the Dog Gurus, which is a pet business consultant company that helps you along in your process. And I also became a member of the IBPSA, and I'm gonna continue learning in dog behavior and dog language. My solution. So as I said, I have ever in my house. My ideal customer earns middle to high income. They work long hours. Most of them have no kids, but their kids are already grown. My ideal dog would obviously be Murphy. <laughs> One that's friendly with people and other dogs, and that would benefit from exercise, playtime, and stimulation. So this is the two existing buildings. Um, this is what we you know, hope the finished product's going to look like. I also would like to get some outside dog equipment so they have something to run and play on or hide. Um, you know, whatever, whatever they need to do. So we calculated everything. The funds I needed is $139,669 to get this business to come to life. That would get a dog ready, the two buildings repaired, the chain link fence that we need, the pea gravel, I would be able to purchase the beds, the bowls, the toys, the activities, get the floor in the two buildings, and to build the kennels. They're little like stalls. Um, I didn't like the idea of them being in metal and didn't like that. So I wanted them to feel like more of a home environment where they can actually rest and be safe. So by having, by winning the start of St. Bernard and having these funds, I would be able to get the two buildings ready to safely house 13 dogs in their kennels and have 20 daycare dogs a day. Um, I would also be able to have enough to hire day staff for day-to-day -day operations. Um, so that would help with that. And I hope to hire another person. I have hired one. I hope to hire another before Thanksgiving. So this is the breakdown of the kennels and daycare sales. Um, I'm also going to have add-on packages that will add on extras. They can, I'm going to offer daycare packages, memberships, bathing, enrichment activities they can add on. And I would hope in the future I can do a positive learning um, to add that. And there's a couple other things that I'm thinking about. So this is just simply the daycare and boarding. And obviously some people that have more than one dog, so they would be boarding more than one dog. So we have identified that with our daycare and boarding, we can comfortably achieve, achieve our sales goal of $197,280 in our first year with a 5% increase in year two at $207,104 and 5% more in year five at $217,008 with room to go grow before meeting our capacity of 394560 servicing 33 dogs per day. So to get the doors open, the funds that we need is $139,669. So by winning Startup St. Bernard, the cash and the in-kind donations, we would be able to get our doors up and open and up and running. And all the contractors that I've already called um, to do the, like the foam insulation, the fencing and uh, electric and plumbing, all of those are local contractors in St. Bernard Parish. I never went to nobody out the parish. Um, I was born and raised in St. Bernard, third generation. I'm a resident of St. Bernard, I'm not going anywhere. And All Tales Wagon would be the first and only dog daycare and boarding business in our parish. Thank you very much, have a tail wagon day. Thank you, that was a great presentation. Who doesn't love a cute puppy dog? You had me at dogs. Um, and the people who know me know how much I love my dogs. Uh, I'm curious about insurance and liability. Like these are people's kids and God forbid something goes wrong. What could go wrong and how are you protected? So by um, being a member of the Dog Gurus, they give us the, like the, it's a six month like program. So the classes I am taking is, is it's called Knowing Dogs. It's how to prevent things from happening before they happen. So knowing the dog body language, knowing the dog behavior, you know, I do meet and greets before the dogs would ever come and meet another dog. And then they would come for an actual like discovery day at the daycare for free before 
we would have a like enroll them in there and then I would let you know just introduce them one dog at a time that I know is a good dog to see how they react if that's going to be bad we're not going to do it we're going to have to offer a, the day boarding instead for a dog that might not rely on that and I have looked into the insurance the insurance is actually very cheap it's only five hundred dollars a year I've talked to multiple people the most expensive thing in the insurance is the property and the buildings in St. Bernard so <laughs> that's Great presentation, love the dog. Um, quick question for you, I wanna make sure that I got this right. So I have two sort of questions. One is on the marketing in terms of how to, how to fill those spaces and what you're planning on doing to, to get that. But then secondarily, on the financials, do you have, you know, so, so a 33 per, a, a sellout of all your kennels, let's just say, that's best case scenario. What, have you thought about, do you have a financial model that talks more about your, your mid-range or have you planned for something that may not be a sellout? Because I, I would imagine it fluctuates seasonally. So we do anticipate the half capacity, at least for the first year. Um, I, that's why I'm going to offer the packages, the memberships, all of the add-ons, the bathing to make up for when we're not in peak season. And I'm going to add the positive learning as well, so that should also in a puppy program and a senior program and a date night, I have a lot of things that I'm going to try to do. Thanks, Jamie, and congratulations on being the answer to the problem. And you being the first mover is pretty exciting. One of the things we all know is that you're the first mover, the copycats move in. And so my question is, how do you really kind of create a moat to kind of work against that? And who are you really selling to? Obviously, it's more than just those who have dogs, right? Meaning those who are going to consider this versus leaving their dog at home or leaving it with a friend. So I'm just curious if you can talk more about your ideal customer and then again, how you're going to manage competition. Oh, sorry. So I believe on the St. Bernard Economic um, website, it said we had 48,000 residents roughly in St. Bernard Parish. So you figure half of those probably have a dog and we're going to go with another half probably has two dogs or more. I think there's more than enough if somebody opens up that we can divide all of this because I'm already panicking thinking I'm outgrowing my house, I might outgrow this. But I do, I, I do have 10 acres so I know I can, you know, if it comes to that we can build larger. The people are buying me. They're buying my vision, what I stand for, my methods, and what I'm learning. Not just, you know, I, all day with the dogs, I do activities. It'll be structured play. So they would come, you know, they would play. We would do an activity. We would go potty. We would have nap time. We would, so there's something throughout the whole day, but every 45 minutes would change. And during, every week I would do something, some kind of activity different, like if it's an agility thing, and I would try to get the parents involved. You know, the person down the street might just simply be watching your dog and not doing anything with the dog, which is sadly what most of the places actually do, and that's not what I want. Hey, Jamie, congrats on all the amazing progress and for the great presentation. Um, how ready do you feel at this juncture to move forward into full-fledged full business ownership, and have you given any thought to creating this as a 501c3 nonprofit or have a nonprofit arm where people can donate um, and or have you extend into, let's say, rescue services, for example. And I'm thinking of Zeus's Rescue in our neighborhood that, that provides um, boarding, grooming, but they also have a robust operations surrounding rescues, play an important mission in the community uh, for supporting those with lost dogs, for example. Um, and, and they have a large impact in our neighborhood and in our community. So have you given any thought to that aspect, how it may help you through any ebbs and flows on the actual boarding business side? Um, and then have you considered doing grooming on top of these services as well? So almost all the groomers in the parish are my friends. So I don't want to step in it, so plus I don't really feel like I'm comfortable grooming very well. I, I groom him, but... He's cute anyway, so I can't, I can't mess that up. But I know I, I did not think about the nonprofit. I did think about the rescues, um, and I am friends with the St. Bernard Animal Shelter, the people that's there. So I would 
try to work with them. Um, I did think about maybe like ones that they have fostered out. Like after they've been in a foster home for maybe a month, I could then take them. I just don't think it would be safe for like a dog that they rescued for me to board it right from their facility. To, and I wouldn't want to get any other dogs sick. So I wanted to make sure like, you know, it's been like a month and they're okay at the foster home so they can come in contact with other dogs. But I would definitely be willing to do that. Hey, yeah, thank you. That was an awesome presentation. Um, I, my family has always been cat people. So I am, I know, I'm sorry. Um, I am pretty new to this. Um, so my biggest question really is how does, um, when you outgrow that space, what does your scaling idea, or what are your plans for scaling look like? Because as you said a minute ago, there's 48,000 people in St. Bernard Parish and say half of those people have dogs and all that. If you are, as you're going to be the only person in St. Bernard right now doing this, if you outgrow that quickly, what, what is your plan? Um, we do have like a 50 stall born and all of that and have a bunch of pastures. So if, you know, down the road, I think it's going to be way bigger than I can handle. I am up to build something bigger and make bigger yards. And so we could do, but as long as it's going to, you know, I'm going to keep my wanting to stay in small groups, you know, and probably rotate the rooms throughout the day if that's, I could do it. I got the land. Yeah. I was just curious about the um, market research that you did where you landed on your prices. So like I said, I'm um, the member of the dog gurus. So I am in all of their Zoom calls with other um, businesses. The lot of the other businesses are, are more than what I'm charging, which eventually I probably will have to go up. But staying with other businesses in New Orleans and Metairie and Slidell, that's kind of what they're doing, but I know they're not offering what I'm offering. So I'm just going to start there and probably work up. Great. So I think that puts us at about, about time now. Uh, so we give a big round of applause, applause for All Tales Wagging and Jamie. Thank you. A big round of applause. Great job. Thank you. And uh, again, uh, hey, everybody. Um, I, Michael Hecht, I apologize for being... Uh, late here, um, but it's it's an incredible timing to have this event, uh, Megan and everybody from St. Bernard, because as a region, we were just named top 10 in the country this week for entrepreneurial startups. It came in last night. It was fantastic to see. And so this is all really part of it. And I think it's very important to note that uh, people tend to think of tech. It's not just tech. Um, it's also a doggy daycare. It's anybody who's taking the initiative to start a business, to provide a service, create a living, and add to culture. And uh, I love that broad definition. So without further ado, we'll bring up our second uh, pitch. This is a safety pouch, safety pouch, I'm sorry, which was created to help facilitate safer interactions for both law enforcement and drivers during traffic stops. Safety pouch, let's see the pitch. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is David Price and I'm the founder and creator of The Safety Pouch and we are on a mission to help create safer and more efficient traffic stops. So, when I was 16 years old, my parents sat me down and they had the talk with me. For those who do not know, the talk is about the do's and don'ts of traffic stops and how to interact with police. And I remember during that conversation, my mom in particular kept going over the fact that if I was pulled over by law enforcement, to make sure that I kept my hands inside at all times. I tried to get all my information together before the officer arrived, but in the event I didn't make sure I knew what the officer, what I was reaching for and where I was reaching. And I started thinking to myself, hmm, I wonder if there is a product available to help facilitate these interactions to prevent the need to actively reach. So yeah, traffic stops are one of the most dangerous situations for officers and drivers to be in. We have seen far too many headlines such as this, so one of the reasons of what the safety pouch actually is, is that it creates a sense of trust and safety for drivers and law enforcement by preventing active reaching. The safety pouch is simple to use. It eliminates the need to actively reach once again. Uh, it's highly effective. It's easy to see. It comes in one color, which is a fluorescent orange to ensure it is easily recognizable and won't be mistaken as a weapon. It simply works as a traditional document holder. You store all your information inside. You can store your driver's license, car insurance, registration inside. Uh, you can store the, the safety pouch directly on, your vehicle, on the vehicle sun visor. That way it is easily accessible in the event you're ever pulled over by law enforcement. And you never have to reach into any enclosed spaces such as your glove compartment. Upon being pulled over, you simply remove the pouch off the visor, roll your window halfway down, place the pouch on the window so when the officer approaches, 
All your information is readily available. You can keep your hands on the steering wheel at all times and keep your hands in sight. And overall, just show immediate compliance and create a safer situation for you and the officer. So our growth so far, I know what y'all are saying, oh my goodness, another hockey stick graph. But <laughs> our growth supports this. Uh, we have done over 650,000 in revenue. Uh, we have sold over 45,000 units globally. Uh, we are ready to establish our own production facility here because despite popular release, it is not cheaper to manufacture in China anymore. It's actually a bit more expensive. Um, and we're ready to expand on our PR and marketing efforts. So as far as where we currently sell, currently sell we currently sell on Amazon.com, Walmart.com, Walmart stores nationwide, and also Sam'sClub.com. So who are our typical customers? Our typical customers are parents, in particular women, who are purchasing for their loved ones, and mainly their children. Uh, they they range, anywhere, range anywhere between the ages of 22 to 68 and make anywhere between 35 to 170,000 a year. So meet the team. You guys already know me, David Price, is Chief Everything Officer. Um, my publicist, Drina Whitfield, um, Brianna Miller, who is our account executive over partnerships, uh, Loren Lewis, who is also our social media manager, um, next into our advisors slash mentors, we have uh, Jason Flom. Uh, Jason is a former chairman of Atlantic Records, which is one of the largest record labels in the world. Um, he's also a board member on the Innocence Project. Uh, Kate McCreary. Kate is my former professor slash mentor who helped push me to create the uh, safety pouch and bring it to market. Uh, Craig Dubitsky. Craig is a serial entrepreneur. He has founded many household CPG products, such as uh, Hello Toothpaste, which was recently acquired by Colgate. Uh, method body wash and EOS chapstick and lotions, uh, and Grabe and Karen Ostaseki, who is also uh, there in the Web3 development space. So these are just some of the reviews from our customers. Um, yep, yeah, these are some of the reviews from our customers. These are our endorsements from our celebrities. Uh, we have received an Instagram post from Viola Davis, uh, just to help bring brand awareness for the product. Uh, Bella and Gigi Hadid, um, anyone who knows me knows I'm the biggest Beyonce fan in the world. And so when Miss Tina, her mom, had posted us on Instagram to say I freaked out was an understatement. Uh, but Miss Tina did so much more for us than that. She also invited us onto her Instagram Live to further our brand awareness and what we were trying to do in our mission. Um, and then she went ahead and told her daughters about us. Um, and Beyonce ended up giving us a grant from her Be Good Foundation, also posting us on her website. Uh, as far as our press, we've been featured in MSNBC, the Tamron Hall Show, People, um, Ebony and the Kelly, um, that Kelly Hall Show, um, just to name a few. So as far as our awards and accolades, we've been, once again, awarded grants by the NAACP, uh, from Beyonce through her Be Good Foundation and Amazon. Uh, recently, in 2022, I was honored by Ebony Magazine as part of their Power 100 list, which is uh, the list of the top 100 black Americans moving black culture forward. Um, and that's just a you know, little bit more thought out list of our uh, endorsements. So what's next for us? We are planning to continue to expand into retail with the goal of six more national retailers by 2026 with the goal of uh, 10,000 plus retail door placements uh, to continue building high, highly influential uh, partnerships with individuals and corporations, as well as expanding our product line through automotive and automotive accessories ranging from CPG to tech. So what will be our impact on the St. Bernard community? Uh, currently, I am being evicted from my current place of storage, which is my parents' house. <laughs> I am getting evil messages on a monthly basis that they cannot walk through rooms anymore, thanks to all of our inventory. So we are looking to uh, establish our headquarters in St. Bernard, as well as our fulfillment center, and immediately hire for fulfillment uh, jobs, as well as establishing an in-house marketing team, um, and to increase marketing spend, but honestly, we have not spent a dime on marketing, so all of our sales have been completely organic and through word of mouth, so imagine what they will be when we spend on marketing. Um, and so this prize money will be used to directly fund those goals. And as far as the future growth, as we continue to grow into retail, we want to continue to add to job fulfillment and other sectors of the business as we hit revenue goals. And we will also be establishing a nonprofit leg of the business. Uh, that way, we will focus on social impact, and that will be in the St. Bernard community and surrounding areas. Um, and as far as in the distant future, we will uh, grow our fulfillment uh, center and warehouse to service other St. Bernard businesses, which is something that is desperately needed, needed in the St. Bernard community. Thank you so much.
Congratulations, David. You make me proud. I just have to say that because you're the reason that we do this work in this space. So congratulations and thank you so much. I'm glad you addressed on that last slide because my first question was gonna be, why are you here? <laughs> However, let me move it to my next question. You mentioned about $650,000 over the lifetime. I'd love to know a little bit about what that lifetime has been and I really wanna kind of bring it down to an annual revenue. So I have a couple of questions and I'll maybe stage them out a little bit. Um, and on the other side of that, I wanna know a little bit about the expenses, kind of how much is it costing? Like what is the per unit cost right now? And then my third question is really similar to what I asked in the first um, round of, of pitching. You're on Amazon, I'm pretty sure this is already out there again or being kind of made in someone else's garage. What is next? How do you expand the life of this product so that there is a need for more fulfillment? So yeah, so the first question, so, so year one we did about 125,000, that was kind of our first year. Uh, second year we did with around, like around 265, um, and that's kind of when we first got into Walmart. Uh, year three, which we're in now, we currently are sitting at around 225, or um, about a few months into that, so we're doing pretty good. We expect to end off around 425, uh, as long as our Current retail orders go through through the end of the year. And as far as you know, projected growth, we are expanding in retail. We're still expanding into Walmart. Uh, we have two more retailers we're currently in talks with, but the goal is to launch into 2024. Um, and so that's kind of what those next two years are being projected on. The second question that was on cop. Yeah, so we've had a few copycatters that have come up, but we have built a really strong brand and thanks to our celebrity endorsements, that has gotten our brand out really, really far. So we have seen a lot of customers go to us because they know what our missions and intentions are. It's not to sell this product, it's not to make it rich off this product. Our goal is to bring awareness to police brutality in particular. Um, and overall, we have done that work. It's not just selling this product, so we've protected ourselves through our brand. Um, and that's why we have customers coming back to us over and over again, purchasing this as gifts for their loved ones. And the third question was, per unit. So yeah, right, that is an ever-changing thing right now. Costs in China is rising, tariffs are rising. Um, so right now on our last order, our landing costs were around 6.45 per unit. Um, and we typically in retail try and keep a 30% profit margin. Um, on, on our online storefront, we usually do around 60%. Um, but as we were seeing that cost increase, and this when we started, we, our landing cost was around $4. So it's steadily rising, and I'm, consent, I'm still seeing that trend. Um, and our goal is also to establish our own production facility here. And our goal is that way we control in-house quality control and overall eventually expand you know, to service other businesses as well. Right now it's $19.99, $20, yeah. Nice to meet you. My name's Chris, congrats on all the amazing progress on the sales and on creating an incredible product that's definitely impactful. Uh, grew up in greater New Orleans. My parents never gave me the talk, either talk, to be honest with you, but um, I have had a gun pulled on me by a Jefferson Parish police officer during a traffic stop as I was reaching. So it definitely re resonates with me. Um, and I'm curious particularly about um, the production facility. Have you done a lot of digging into how much that's gonna cost you and where that might get your unit cost. And just talk a little bit about, a little bit more, I appreciate the slide, but talk a little bit more on if you were to win this award, what uh, your commitment would, would be to St. Bernard in particular. First of all, I'm so sorry that happened to you. We have worked very closely directly with uh, law enforcement, uh, both NOPD and Jefferson Parish and the state troopers uh, to train them on this product and making them aware of what it is and how it works. And they have been very receptive of it. Um, I wanted to go to the impact part, that way I can, okay, thank you. So, the immediate right now is to establish headquarters and the fulfillment center, because I need somewhere to store my products. I'm being kicked out of my house, well, my parents' house. Um, but as far as, you know, economic development, we will be hiring for fulfillment and marketing. Great job, I had heard about you before this before, like I've heard about you for about a year, so I'm excited to see you and meet you. Um, it's really, it's really fascinating. I, I have two questions. One is on the financials. Second is more on the feedback that you've received from um, the law enforcement agencies that you have been working with, and 
do they also find it to be helpful? So that would be sort of the easier question to, to answer. My second question as it relates to the financials, your growth plan, does that incorporate what does that incorporate what your what's going to happen to your margins when you do open your fulfillments um, facility as well as hire new staff? So the first question was like feedback on law enforcement. So law enforcement love this product because it shows immediate compliance, all your information is there, and as much as it's scary for us to reach for our our uh, registration or whatever's in our glove compartment, officers are scared as well because they don't know you. They don't know what you're trying to do. And so unfortunately, we all have biases. Um, and so that's always going to come into play in our reactions. So officers love this because it makes the traffic stop a lot easier and safer for everyone. Second question was the financial. So when I talked about the <clears throat> production facility, that was, like I said, a three or five year plan. Um, so I have not really taken an account yet of what those margins may be. The goal with that would be this is maybe another stream of revenue for the business because we'll be able to service other businesses as well with that. Um, but the overall thing with me was that it was going to, I have seen a rise in costs um, on the tariff side of dealing with uh, our China, Chinese manufacturer. Um, so with the goal of that is to eliminate that tariff cost. And with that, I, I assumed at least we should be able to break around the same price, if not a little bit lower, because we're saving on shipping also in the process. Super impressive. Congratulations. I hope my kids are half as impressive as you are um, with such an interesting insight. The, I'm, I'm, I am curious about the consumer usage. So this feels like something mom might get me, not my mom clearly, but mom would get their child. And um, I'm we're curious about adoption because my kids are disorganized. Where's my license? It's in my jean pocket. Uh, where are the paper for the car? Here, you're requiring a different type of consumer behavior, that they have to be really organized to make it work. Have you gotten any feedback on that? And I'm curious about what the technology version of this product looks like, because now everyone has their phones and they hold up everything. Is there a tech version that you're thinking about? This is something that a lot of moms obviously buy for their children. What, so I'm the creator of the product. Would I, if I saw this when I was 18, would I buy it? Probably not, because I, I did not view this as like, a thing that may affect me, oh, it affects him, but it'll never happen to me. My mom has the insight to see that, no, it very much will, can happen to you. So that's why I designed a product to kind of be like a wallet, like a car wallet. So it automatically keeps your insurance inside, your registration, if you have a permit. Now, I don't personally store my license in it full time because I use my license for other things, but I always know where my license is at, which is in my wallet. So I can easily take that in and out and put that in a pouch and place it on a window. So as far as organization or the need to be mature, Remember where you put your stuff and take it in and out. I don't see that as an issue. I haven't heard, I haven't heard it back as an issue from any of the feedback we've um, heard from our customers. Because um, my thing is I want my customers to know that I'm always open. On each order, I send out a card and has my personal phone number on it. And they, I always get calls from our customers. And all of our feedback has always been positive, especially when they're purchasing for their children. And then there was a second part. Oh, yeah, tech bird. So, yeah, that's actually an idea I've been fooling with for a little minute now and I've kind of been working on. So our goal with this is similar like, kind of to the LA wallet. You have your driver's license on the side, but it doesn't let you put your registration or your insurance. So my goal was that would be I envision that to be a digital app that will allow you to have all that information in one app, uh, basically a QR code where the officer could come up and scan through your phone. Because I, I know that's a big issue that I've heard from officers that they don't want to physically hold the driver's phone because that then makes them liable if they drop it or anything like that and anything happens to it. So that's one issue that they have with LA Wallet. So my goal with, with my idea would be that it would be a scannable QR code or even within a proximity basis through Bluetooth where your information can be transferred to that officer through the application. David, great, great work, obviously. Um, kind of bouncing off of that, you know, this is a really killer product. Um, how are you planning to expand your product line based off of the feedback that you've gotten and kind of the growth of where um, where you're, you've been going, right? You've already got 45,000 45, of these that are out in people's cars, out in people's, in people's hands. What's kind of next for that development of, of the product and then uh, your product line, I guess? I think you kind of touched on it earlier. So tech is next. That is what we're working on. That is... The way that the future is moving, that is how we're going to stay relevant in this space, I believe. And I didn't design this product just to be a physical thing you would buy and then just use and then 
throw away after a while once it gets old. My goal with this was to become like a social commentary to show, yeah, it's a great tool, but also to show the extents that drivers and people are having to go through now to create stuff like this, to purchase stuff like this, to feel safe during those interactions. So it's a lot of things, and my thing is I'm really proud of that it started a dialogue, um, and that's kind of why we've gotten all that press. Great, thank you. Um, okay, big hand for David and Safety Pouch. Thank you so much. Um, and last and not least, we have Utopian Gaming, who is seeking to expand their services to include a family entertainment center in St. Bernard. Utopia, Utopian Gaming, come on down. Thank you. Great, thank you. Good morning. So I'm Gene Dixon. I'm the owner and manager of Utopian Gaming. I'm technically second generation entrepreneur. Um, my mom, she walked out with the baby. So it's her fault and my uncle's fault that I'm doing this. <laughs> so I am a native of Jefferson Parish. I'm currently residing in Algiers, which is right across the water from St. Bernard. So I know this is a pitch competition, but let's go back in time for a little bit. <laughs> it's the 80s and 90s, so Friday, Y'all jump in the car, y'all go to the video store. Most of us, we're gonna rush right up to that, where that wall where it says new releases, grab that tape and run to the counter hoping that that new release is actually in stock. And when you get there, you find out it is. And then it comes to begging your parents to let you do a weekend rental and not a day rental because we all know you cannot beat that game in one day. <laughs> they agree, you're in heaven, game on. You don't even know what happens between a car and home. You just know that you get home, you pop that game in, and it's on. Friends, family, parents, everybody in the living room playing games, board games, video games, all weekend. Just fun, exciting, good time. That's what Utopian Gaming is. So, a little backstory on the business. We started December. <laughs> we started in December of 2020 during a pandemic because we knew that families were ultimately gonna need places to go for entertainment. They've been cooped up in a the house. They're gonna want something to do. So we started Utopian Gaming. That's our first store. We, we had the vision of having this store, the front being retail, which you can see, and the back ultimately becoming a game lounge where people came in, if they didn't feel like shopping, they went in, hung out, and played games. Well, we ended up getting forced out of that lease, and we had to move moved to a smaller store in the same mall. That store could not handle a game lounge. But we were still focused <laughs> and hopeful that we would be able to get this game lounge going. And then, unfortunately, we got forced out of that lease. But it wasn't too unfortunate because this is what happened. We were able to expand. We moved to 605 Lapalco. We have our game store in the front. We have a nice size game lounge where families can now come and play and enjoy time together. So our game store, our game store sells pop figures, collectibles, games, board games, video games, everything gaming, anime, and pop culture related. It doesn't matter what you're into, you can find something over here at Utopian Gaming. Our game lounge, that's, that's my favorite part. So the game lounge has state-of-the-art gaming equipment. We have board games, video games, PCs, latest-gen consoles, the consoles and PCs are loaded with games, over 130 games in the board game library. Perfect place to come play, to come for open play, esports events, parties, corporate events. You can get memberships, do fundraising. Anything gaming centric that you want to do, you can do it over at Utopian Gaming. So the open play, the open play is probably going to be the most um, popular one because it's more of an option for the individuals as well as the groups, small groups, families looking for a nice little game night, affordable option. You come in, you pick how long you want to play, you pick what consoles or what platforms you want to play on, and you get to gaming. Um, like I said, perfect for small groups and individuals. For the bigger groups and for celebrations, you're going to probably want our party packages. 10 to 15 people plus the Gamer of Honor. You get a portion of the game lounge reserved for you. You're going to have food options. Everyone can chill out, play some games, even the parents, because they now don't have to worry about, um, I guess, basically taking care of all the party needs. Utopian Gaming is going to take care of all of that. It's kind of like a game truck, but way better. More gaming options. 
you're in, you have the kids in one place, they're not running in and out of the house, letting all the cool air out. And we all know the value of cool air, especially right now. For our bigger groups, schools, businesses, they can rent the entire lounge out. They can do field trips, team building events, I mean, not customer, employee appreciation days and professional development. We have games that we can basically tailor to the lessons. If the schools or the business has like a team building, we can incorporate games with those lessons and things like that. Basically, you can have fun. It beats the old boring team building where you sit in there and have somebody stand in front of you like I'm doing, giving a presentation. It makes it fun, more fun. So I, I would prefer that over regular stuff. And then you can also use our game lounge for fundraising and spirit nights. So schools, churches, nonprofits, they can do their fundraisers and spirit nights to raise funds for whatever they need. Um, equipment, sending the kids to camp, or just whatever they, you know, operating expenses. I mean, <laughs> whatever the organiz organization needs, we can do it. How many people know what esports is? Awesome, yes, finally. <laughs> Most people are like, I don't know what that is. So well, for those that didn't raise their hand, basically esports is competitive gaming where you do it in front of spectators. It's kind of like when you go watch football, baseball, all of that stuff, but they're on the games, they're on the computers, they're competing kind of like the kids in that picture right there. What Utopian Gaming wants to do is introduce that to our K-12 programs. A lot of the universities, I know Loyola, Tulane, um, shoot, Delgado, LSU, Nichols, they have programs already. But as I'm going to a lot of the schools, I'm realizing they don't have programs. A lot of the administration tell me, what is esports? So we want to get that introduced into our schools because there are several opportunities, like being a professional game player, esports um, careers, scholarships from the universities, broadcasting, team management, audio, visual, video, kind of like what these guys have set up here. You have to do the same thing for esports competition. And those are valuable skills that those children and those students can take with them and even open a business, kind of like the people that are putting on this production. We also know that a lab will cost about 15 to 20,000 each lab. That's pretty expensive for a high school. Well, Utopian Gaming has taken that on. We have all the consoles, PCs, titles, recording equipment, everything you need. Basically, the kids just come to us, basically like we're, we're, we're a stadium. They go to the football stadium, they play the game. They come to Utopian Gaming, they, play, they do their esports competition. And that's what we would be. We also have secured networks so that they can do online, so we can have kids in this area playing kids in Shreveport, Baton Rouge, all over. They don't have to always travel because they'll have their safe, secure network to play over. Looking forward, what do we want to do? What is Utopian Gaming going to do? I went too fast. <laughs> we want to get to host larger scale esports events for K-12 as well as on a professional level. We want to expand to virtual reality, augmented reality, and of course continue to upgrade our computers, consoles, board games on a regular basis. One of the more exciting things we want to do is the recording studios. We want to give our content creators the opportunity to not have to spend thousands of dollars on equipment and come to us. They can rent a, a soundproof booth, record their content, then go home, edit it, put it on YouTube, TikTok, all the social media, new and old that's coming out. Also, we want to ultimately bring our equipment for esports to K-12 schools and auditoriums so that we can introduce more kids to esports, giving more kids the opportunity to take advantage of some of the career opportunities and scholarship opportunities out there. Also, summer camps and school break camps. Basically, let the kids come hang out. They're not in school, let them hang out, play some games, learn about esports, learn about different things, and really have fun. They're gonna be playing games anyway, mess with do it with some friends. And the courses, that's gonna be a pretty cool one. So we're gonna work with businesses and nonprofits to start doing courses like design, game design, board game design, computer building, coding, all that fun stuff. So I said a lot, I guess we'll talk about a little bit of money. So <laughs> to visit our, <laughs> visit our lounge, those are our hourly rates. You can see that they're pretty low and it's purposely done 
because we are designed for the family to be able to come and enjoy time together. The board game rates, table rates, that's for the entire table. So basically a family of four can come in for four hours and play for $20. That's like what, $5 a person? That's, that's a, but that's a, um, if you're on a budget, that's great to me. Um, <laughs> the video game rates, that's per station, but we can add, and that's per person. So basically one person a station, but we can add a, another controller for about $6 which is still a great budget. I don't know about y'all, but the last time I went to the movies, it took us about four, four people, about $60. You're, you're winning with our prices, okay? You're, that, that's already a win when you walk through the door. We're gonna also offer memberships. Forgive me, I was kind of rushing and I did not put the prices. So our memberships are gonna be basically recurring revenue for the business. And we're gonna have three different packages. Gamer is gonna be the lowest cost. It's gonna be about $50 a month. Super is gonna be second. It's gonna be at 70 and actually the ultimate, and the ultimate package is gonna be the most expensive at $80, but you get everything basically unlimited. You walk in, you get to a board game table, you get to a station and you play all day and all night. Like I said, we're gonna be able to have parties. Two hour and three hour parties, those are, that's everything you get with them. Two hour parties you get plus the gamer. 15 guests for the three hour party plus the Gamer of Honor. The two prices that you see at the bottom, those are for weekday and weekend prices. So the first price is weekday, second price is weekend. We're also gonna have add-ons like photo booth, extra food, extra time, extra gamers. So those prices actually may go up um, in some cases or depending on the special we have, it may go down. For private events, remember I said businesses and schools can book us for their private events. That's a weekly special, I mean weekday special and weekend special, and we're gonna have a requirement of a minimum of two hours for our private events. So these are some projections that we put together. Basically, I, I did it to make it a little more friendly to the eye, so I just did January to, fe to December in order. Um, as you can see, the first year, what we anticipate is about 20,000 in profit after all overhead is taken care of. And those, those numbers gradually increase throughout the year with about a three to 4% increase in sales that you notice between the years. When you see the bumps, that's usually where we're anticipating different events going on. For example, the first year, you see that first bump? We're thinking that's gonna be more of your bump up in revenue because of your summer camp and your parents that are preparing for that summer rush, it's gonna bump up a little bit. Then it's gonna kind of even out and then bump up again in October because of course you have your, your Halloween and your ho Halloween and the holidays coming a little bit after that and that's more parties, field trips and things like that. Two and three, you see that bump in the summer and that's because we're gonna, that's when we plan on really introducing our classes. So we're gonna have summer camp and classes and summer camps coming to visit the space. So that's where you see the bump up and then a little bit of a dip down because we're expecting a dip down when the kids go back to school. You know, uh, unfortunately less fun, but you know, it's still gonna be a little bit of um, time to have fun and enjoy yourself. And of course, in December of each month, each year, we expect to have some increases. So what does that mean for St. Bernard? Let's see, so I did a little dictative work. See Dick Tracy right there? Me and him was in St. Bernard and we, um, <laughs> we St. Bernard has a little over 44,000 residents, 70% home ownership, and the median age is about 34 years old. So what that tell me? That told me that y'all in St. Bernard have people that are staying. People aren't, you know, a year here, a year there, they're staying. And St. Bernard has everything you need already. Grocery stores, healthcare, banks, jobs, safety, but you don't have family entertainment. So we're gonna, we want to solve that problem for you. So what happens if we were to win the day? We immediately begin looking for a space, about 3,000 to 4,000 square feet that can house everything we want, plus the recording booths for the future. We're gonna use the funds to secure a location, build out, hire, and market. We know that marketing is like important, especially for a family entertainment center. So we're gonna use a lot of marketing, the in-kind services, 
financials, everything to market <laughs> and get our name out there and have everyone knowing that we're there so that we can grow to become a fixture in the St. Bernard community and surrounding parishes. That's our contact information. We are, like I said, we are open on the West Bank right now. Give us a call. And if you want to book parties, utopiangaming.com is going to shoot us an email. Questions. <laughs> great, great job. Questions. Chris, you look like a gamer. I am for sure, or not, not as much as I would like to be. Uh, Gene, congratulations on starting an awesome company business and, and on your presentation as well. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, Utopian Gaming is doing right now, your current West Bank operation? You mentioned um, having to bounce from, from place to place, uh, but just tell us about how the uh, entity is faring right now. And I'm also curious about your vision for these STEM events that you're intending to hold. Have you held any before? Are you holding them currently? Um, what do your existing partnerships look like? If so, and if not, what is your vision for that? So yes, with our two, well, yeah, with our moves, unfortunately, we have not been able to be open for an entire year yet. So that is hurting. And with our last move, it took a lot of build out. We had a lot of delays and that it, it's, it took our entire marketing budget. So right now, we are organically marketing. Whatever little bit of funds we get, we are putting to our marketing. Unfortunately, right now, we are not profitable. We plan to be once we are able to get the marketing in place. Uh, we are gaining traction within our community over on the West Bank. Um, everyone that walks in is like, finally, the West Bank has it. it has something for us. because. The West Bank doesn't have much in the way of family entertainment either. I mean, we're unfortunately, like St. Bernard, we don't like, I guess the families just fall by the wayside when it comes to entertainment. As far as our nonprofit work, right now we're working with actually two nonprofits, IGL Foundation and Sohinyu Art Circle. IGL works with a lot of the tech side. Sohinyu does more of the visual art. And we're going to continue to um, advance our nonprofit and community outreach. My girlfriend actually is a counselor, so she's going to put together what is, I will, if I, I say it wrong, forgive me, it's gamification. Basically, it's a way of counseling, but you're using the games to, to help your customer, well, your client. So that's uh, where we plan to go, and that's where we kind of are right now as far as our classes and events. Awesome. Thank you, Jean. I'm a West Banker, and I agree. We need more. For both kids and adult kids alike, and I can certainly see the similarities between the markets, right, between St. Bernard and, and West Bank. My question was going to be, you mentioned several incredible opportunities in what you're selling. And I was curious, especially with thinking about the St. Saint, the Saint Bernard market, between the esports with the schools, the corporate side, I'm calling it open play for families and then parties, where do you see some of the revenue coming from or what do you want to most pursue for that particular audience? I think the parties and esports are going to be our biggest draws, especially once we are having the schools and the professional stuff in. The parties, of course, I mean, people have birthdays every month. So every weekend we'll be able to handle about nine to 15 parties giving parents you know, a bit of a break from the party planning and just opportunity to come and relax because we are a place for the adults and kids alike. So the parents can kind of switch gears and instead of just being a party planner, be a party participant. And that's where we think most of our revenue will come from, but we're also gonna be leaning on our store because we're gonna be switching the store from just being in store to online as well. And we're also going to be offering well, once our printer gets back up and running, because it was down for about a year, we're going to be offering direct-to-garment printing, basically your graphic T-shirts. We're going to allow people to bring their own designs in, print it out for them, however many they need. So that's going to be basically a whole nother print, print service. It's going to be a whole nother stream of revenue for us. So we're going to continue to add things to you know keep growing the revenue side. Thank you. This is very interesting and a great presentation. I'm curious about two things. One, the user behavior within the 
within location, is it, are you finding that parents are just dropping their kids off? Are they staying there? Is it a really mix of kids and adults or is it primarily kids? And then, which brings me to my second question, which is what are the liability concerns with this? Well, what we're finding is that, you know, most people think gamers just sit in their room, play games, look at a TV and scream at a TV. We're finding that that's not true. We find that the kids get in there, they may be quiet at, for a little while, they like to the game by themselves, and then the next thing you know, they hear somebody say, I'm about to play Fortnite, and they're like, oh. And then you have a whole lounge full of kids screaming, I'm about to die, give me this, give me that. Like, it, it's, it really becomes very social, and it's fun. And the parents actually, th most of them sit in, and you hear the parents, shh, and we're like, no, that's what they're here for. Yeah, like you go back to your board game or you go back to watching your movie, let these kids play. So, and the liability side of it, um, we, we have like things like rubber floors, uh, soft, you know, soft uh, sofas, things like that. Um, so we have insurance <laughs> and we, one thing that we also do is when the parents do leave the kids, we tell the parents, look, they're only leaving with you. So when it's time for them to go, that time is up, we'll say, hey, call your mom, call your dad, let them know they need to, they need to come get you. Because that way we don't have, oh, this is my friend. Nah, we ain't going with friends. We're going with mom or dad, whoever drops you off. So we try to, I guess, mitigate that side of the liability by making sure that we know who's picking them up and who's dropping them off. Thank you, Jean. That was um, really well done and really exciting to see like family entertainment, like wholesome family entertainment being, um, being brought back to life. It almost feels a little retro, you know. Um, building bricks and mortar is expensive, right? Is the vision like a world where we've got bricks and mortars in every single city that has this concept, or is it more you want to anchor and then you want to go more in the virtual world? How do you how do you grow this beyond the square feet? Basically, what I see is, and I've told my thirteen year old this all the time: we want to take over Southeast. United States, with our game lounges, with our esports offerings. We want to be, when someone says gaming and esports, especially in Southeast United States, we want them to say utopian gaming. When you think diapers, you think pampers, right? That's what we're trying to be. Now, the other side of it, I guess the more um, online side, we do want to be able to offer our tournaments and everything online so that then we're reaching the whole United States and hopefully the world because the internet's everywhere. It's a worldwide web. So we want to become a part of that. And we want to start, keep the brick and mortar going, of course, because people need a, we want people to have a place to go, not just sit in a room or sit on a game at home. We want them with a place to go. And we're gonna then use the technology side to just really further our reach and get people more excited and hopefully make us have to go to their city with a brick and mortar. Um, so cool. So I've got kids that are very into board games right now and also on the West Bank. West Bank is, yeah, you know, best bank. Um, but one of the things that I, uh, it is the best bank. Um, one, of, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things that I, that jumped out at me with this, um, especially looking at your pricing for like the day, day to day. Um, my kids have a board game club at school that they could join, right? What is enticing me and my family or these groups to come and play board games specifically at a, at a game lounge than it is to what, for what would be about the cost to just buy that game themselves and bring it home? Um, what, is, kind of, what does that customer look like and what, what specifically are you guys offering that is going to bring them back again and again? So we're offering, number one, the social aspect. So you're, you can sit at home with your family and play board games all day, but you're not going to make any new friends. You're not going to, you're, you're going to have to go to the store to buy a new game. We have a library there for you. So you can come to us and you can play the old games that you know, but you can also look on the shelf and say, oh, this one looks interesting. Let's try it. And then even better news, we have a retail store in front. So if you want to buy it, you can go buy it in most, in most cases. Um, the other draw to the kids having board game board game clubs at school is that we also have a bigger location so you you're probably not able to go and you know play the board games i don't know how it's set up but i would imagine that they're not like oh everyone comes and play board games at the school it's more the kids they come and they they get to play well what we have is everyone can be there playing 
so you can actually benefit a little more from us because you can tell your kids, oh, I heard y'all were playing A, B, and C game. Show us, teach us. And then maybe y'all will make some new friends or new, meet some new families and make it a, a hub for gaming and socializing. So it's not just always the gaming for us, it's also the socializing aspect community. and community and building community. Like I said, I love when the kids come in quiet and then the next thing you know, they're screaming across the lounge because they need something and that person's beating them. It's, it's, just, it's just the community aspect of it is really what, uh, what does it for us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Am I allowed to come and play D&D &D like old school, Gary Gygax style? All right. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, so three amazing presentations. I think that our esteemed judges are now going to retreat to their lair to go and um, cogitate on this for a while. And while they cogitate, we can masticate on some delicious food over here in the cafe bar area. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody online. Okay, well, you always make the judging hard, robust conversations. Um, it was, a, it's, the pitches were amazing, the ideas are amazing, dogs, gaming, safety, all really relevant topics that everyone's passionate about to different levels of degree. So I wanna thank, before we announce the winner, I wanna thank All Tales Wagging, The Safety Pouch, and Utopian Gaming, just for showing up and doing such a great job. <laughs> But fortunately and unfortunately, there has to be only one winner. Um, and after a long conversation, we are most excited and are honored to recognize the safety pouch as the winner of this competition. Great. There you go. And this feels very surreal. I'm extremely excited and happy. I can't wait to go ahead and use these funds to help continue to grow and expand the business. Our next step is establishing our warehouse because I'm getting kicked out of my parents' house so I can no longer store our products there anymore and from there continue to grow and expand our team. I know the judges had a hard time picking. They had two other really great amazing businesses and I am just so excited to see what they continue to do going forward.